Okay, welcome everyone. So you have arrived at a webinar um, introducing you to models of trauma-informed healthcare. Uh, I'm Angela Kennedy, I'm a psychologist based in uh, Tuve at the moment, and we have our, the trauma-informed care team have worked with the Recovery College Online to bring a series of webinars around trauma-informed uh, areas, experiential learning mainly, to do with um, how we are responding to the issues of crisis presented by the pandemic. So welcome. We are just going to have a bit of a run through around what trauma-informed care means and how to do it. Uh, and it would be really helpful if you had any comments or questions, please post them in the chat. And I am hoping to get um, enough time at the end to be able to pick those up with you. Uh, but if not, what I'll do is I'll respond to them afterwards. And um, I'm assuming we have a list of everyone who's on here and we will circulate it to you. Um, is that right? Do we have a list of everyone that we can email? <clears throat> so the thing about um, trauma and adversity is that it does touch everyone to some degree. Nobody can get away uh, without having some kind of stress and troubles in their life at some point. So please use your usual sources of support if you find this conversation uh, a bit triggering. And I know that some people might be in difficult circumstances now. There are many different definitions of trauma-informed care out there and, you know, have an explore. But I think what's important to know is that it's a system-wide approach, trauma-informed care. Uh, and that means that it's about how we, as communities and services, address the adversity that underlies a lot of uh, distress and suffering, particularly focusing on the impact it has on our relationships and how we can heal that. So it is a system. We need a system based on knowledge of what's needed for healing. Um, and it has relevance to everyone in the system because of that. So it's not just frontline workers, but it's also uh, managers and senior leaders and all of those corporate people who keep those services going. It's about creating healthy places of work because you can't be trauma informed for people who are using services if you're not also trauma informed with each other. And so workplace place cultures create the culture of trauma informed care uh, uh, for frontline delivery as well. It also focuses efforts on prevention of harm, um, including harm that might be done by services quite inadvertently. I think it's important because it places the lived experience at the centre of the healing process uh, and focuses on strengths and builds support towards engaging with the complexity that that healing often requires. So, um, I'm going to show you a video before I say anything else, because the video can say it better than me. The Scottish, um, Scotland have got a national programme of trauma informed care, and it's well worth looking at their resources. This is a fantastic video created by them. Here goes. Whenever mum went away, he would come into my room. He said I made him do it, and that it meant he loved me. It always made me feel powerless, ashamed. I never knew when an argument would turn into a fight. I was always scared, always in edge, always had to be ready to defend myself. 
ex-husband was very controlling, always put me down, told me what to wear or cook. He'd get angry if I didn't do things right. I had no choice or control. It made me feel useless. I had no confidence in the end. So I zoned out, pretended it wasn't happening. It's so difficult to trust people now. I just freeze and float away in my head when I feel powerless. Now I just get angry a lot. I feel like I want to fight. Sometimes I worry I'm just like him. I find it difficult to do things myself and I get really nervous when I have to talk to new people. I avoid them when I can. What we went through was traumatic because we were harmed physically, emotionally and felt like we were in real danger. Traumatic experiences can be things that happen once, a serious accident or assault. Or it can be where traumatic things keep happening, like physical or sexual childhood abuse, or domestic abuse, or relationships where you can't be yourself, where you're put down or bullied. It can make you feel powerless, trapped or betrayed. The sense of confusion, shame or fear can be overwhelming, especially if there is no one you feel able to tell. Even after it's over, it's harder to get on with life and feel safe. Trauma is more common than most people think. Almost one in five adults has experienced physical or sexual abuse in their childhood. And more than a quarter of all women have experienced domestic abuse. Some people recover after traumatic events. Some people aren't affected as much. Having good, safe, supportive relationships with other people can really help. But lots of people continue to be affected by trauma, sometimes long after it happened. For most of us, Traumatic or adverse childhood experiences like these affect our body's response to stress, affecting our physical health as well as our mental health. The impact of trauma can also make it harder for us to learn and to realise our full potential. One of the most worrying things about the experience of trauma is that it can make us avoid people and places, even if they are there to help, like doctors, teachers, social workers, carers, colleges, councils community centres, employers, advisors. Because most trauma experiences happen in relationships with other people, we can find it difficult to trust people or feel safe. And sometimes the way we react, to help ourselves feel safe, pushes people away and makes it even harder to get the help we need. It's like our brains learn survival tricks to get us through the trauma at the time, like priming us for danger. Making us run away. Shutting down when we feel upset. It might look like we have a short fuse, like we're unfriendly, or we're just a bit absent. Anything, however small, that reminds us of that trauma can set off our own unique trauma response to protect ourselves, making us avoid the people and places that we need the most. Like you. But there are things you can do to help me trust you enough so I feel safe and I don't shut down or avoid you. You can offer me a different relationship that doesn't remind me of the one I had when I was a kid. One where I feel safe, I feel empowered and I have choice and control over what happens to me. One where we work together and I can trust you. This is called being trauma informed in the way you work. Being trauma-informed means thinking about what will make me feel safe. It might mean offering me choice over the sex of the person offering me care or support, especially if it involves intimate care or examinations. Unfortunately, your usual care worker Heather's off sick will be sending someone else instead. Do you have any preferences about who comes instead? Well... I'd feel more comfortable with someone I've met before. Most importantly, I'd like a woman. Well, how about June? She's worked with us for three years. 
If there's anything you'd like her to do that Heather normally does, just ask. Trauma-informed means empowering me to have control and take an active role in what happens to me. We know some people don't like coming to the dentist, so is there anything that you're worried about or scared of? I can tell you each step I'm doing, so there are no surprises if you'd like. If you need me to stop, how will you tell me? Trauma-informed means helping me to trust you by being clear about what will happen, doing what you say you will do when you said you would do it. Unfortunately, our advisors are running about 30 minutes late. I'm so sorry about that. Are you able to stay or can we make another appointment for you? Many of us at work will have had our own experiences of trauma in our own lives or we might witness or hear about it in the course of our work. So the same principles apply to all of us. We all need to take care of ourselves by making sure we're safe and connected to the people and activities that matter to us. Can you think of anyone you've met or worked with recently that a trauma-informed approach would have made a difference to? Are there any trauma-informed changes you might make that could make a difference? So if you offer me safety and choice, if you collaborate with me and empower me and help me trust you, then you will help me work with you. Even if I only meet you once, even briefly, you can give me a different kind of relationship one where I feel valued and valuable, connected and safe. And when that happens over and over again with everyone that I meet, I can learn that it's safe to make connections with people. It is those connections that we all need to access life chances and reach our full potential. So I hope you'll agree that that, that really is a, a, an amazing video, uh, well worth watching, I think, um, again and again. What, what I really like about it is that uh, it's, it's very uh, personable. I think it's very engaging. There's nothing about it I would change. Those principles at the end are really important. You know, Trauma and adversity really does disempower people. People can feel very powerless. And so it's important that we offer choices over recovery. It's important that things are very collaborative. And when you've been hurt by other people, it is hard to trust. So those things need to be worked on and built over time. Um, and safety is critical. You know, what we think can be safe can actually be quite triggering for other people and sometimes quite disempowering. So those principles, I think, are universally accepted as being the core relational principles of trauma-informed care. So I think this piece of artwork describes it very well. It's a young child facing a, a quite scary um, big black crow. Um, it's called The Child and His Anxiety. And the thing about trauma that makes trauma-informed care, that makes it essentially quite a challenge is that we're facing the darkest reality of our human nature in terms of the depths at which we can hurt each other. And that's really challenging uh, for us, I think. And, you know, there are lots of things that can be traumatizing, but I just want to talk about the main areas as social animals. Yes, events that provoke fear or pain, you know, fear, particularly fear of death, can be traumatizing, but we're also as social animals primed to find things traumatizing which provoke loss um, or things that exclude us from other people. We're particularly prone to being traumatized by relationships which inflict, inflict harm on us rather than just kind of accidents. Um, we seek meaning in things, so things that challenge our sense of reality uh, can be very hurtful for us. 
also what I think one of the things we forget about it's not just those actions that are, are um, put, um, do something to us but it's also the absence of clay or neglect particularly in children um, because it can leave people without the basic structures to manage um, uh, emotional structures to man manage other things and it's as if you're not worth any attention at all good or bad the other thing is that it doesn't always have to happen to you it can um, you can be traumatized by witnessing any of those things or being on the receiving end of the reactions so often if people have been traumatized in one generation that can cascade down through generations and then the person left um, the younger person who's grown up within those traumatized relationships have no sense of what it is that has caused that trauma in them but it's not just those and as that video um, points out you know th these things are, are built up and our resilience, if that's what you want to call it, is created by the community around us. And um, there are certain factors that make things more traumatizing. So the earlier the age that it was that happened, that causes more problems. If you're closer to the person who hurt you, that's more likely to cause more damage. If it goes on for longer, that's more problematic. Yes, there are severity things to do with the act, but that's not always the most traumatizing thing. You can be traumatized by sometimes quite small things if it's early enough in your life by somebody close enough to you. But there's a lot that we can do to support people at the time and often having adequate information um, about our reactions can really help us make sense of it in a way that's not pathologizing, where we don't end up feeling that it's not understandable or that there's something about us. And if we think about, you know, generally our community, you know, all of these issues of safety are kind of in there with other issues like uh, the economy and equality and uh, how physically fit we are and whether we get justice over those actions, um, how uh, these things are reflected in culture and the arts, our personal connectedness with other people, all of these things kind of um, play in together to create mental health of populations but like you know these grapes we as humans are sculpted by the environment in which we grow um, and we accept that very easily when it comes to wine for example that it's going to be different wine completely dependent on not just the soil and the sunshine but even the year in which it's grown and yet with humans sometimes we think that the problems or or, or our strengths are all to do some somehow with what we're born with. And I think the fundamental principle of trauma from care is that it is different from that. It accepts us as beings in, our, in a context. So there is a lot of evidence. I'm not gonna talk a great deal about it, but you know, child maltreatment particularly is a cause of health inequality. Um, people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged are more at risk of social injustice. And although, it's uh, the evidence is there. We pay very little attention and put very little resources in to try and to do anything about it. Trauma and phone care is one um, way of trying to contribute to something that seems a bit fairer for people. Now, one of the things that you might have heard about is, is ACEs. And this is a concept that um, is used, emerged from public health. So it's not necessarily that useful when thinking about individuals, but in terms of public health risks of having later adult problems, there's a kind of checklist of adverse childhood experiences on the screen there that you can see that covers a wide vari variation of, of things. And they've used ACE scores. So how many out of 10 people can tick? And you can find that the greater the ACE score, the greater are the risks of many different things. Now, of course, as I've just mentioned, these are not straightforward. It's often to do with the age you were, what support you have, and how long these things go on for. But as a kind of general rule of thumb for, for calculating population risks, it's quite helpful. And you know, you might be all there at the moment totting up your ACE score. Um, I mean, my own ACE score is actually very low. 
But what I can say is that whilst I don't feel at all traumatized by that, um, what I do think it gave me was a sense of uh, empathy and a search for justice with these issues. Um, so if we look at the increase in ACE score with alcoholism, for example, but this graph is there for everything. Um, it's there for uh, um, job problems, it's there for hallucinations, it's there for suicide attempts. So uh, it's also there for risk of um, some health problems like cancer and heart disease. So the body and the mind kind of play out together. And what they found is that for people with high ACEs, they have a, a reduced life expectancy by almost 20 years. And this is with many, many thousands of people. You know, what else in this country would we ignore if it created a 20 year difference in life expectancy? For me, that's a big motivator. And as you can see there, it increases risk of suicide attempts in the population as well. So trauma affects your physical health, both in terms of pain and nausea, anxiety, sweating, headaches, but our relationships with ourselves and others like shame and guilt, trust, isolation, um, and our mental health flashbacks, seeing you know, or hearing things that other people don't see, anxiety, numbness, emotional numbing, phobias, paranoia. Um, and I think it's, it's our job often as mental health clinicians, for those of you who are, is to work out how these things fit together for the individual in front of us. And in terms of how it affects you know, our lives, it can mean that we don't trust people, we feel powerless, we can have strong emotions. It impacts us capacity to manage those emotions sometimes. It affects our beliefs about ourselves. We can learn to avoid or suppress certain needs. We can sometimes be less caring or more caring, too caring, um, try hard to please people all the time. And it's possible that it can affect how secure we are in relationships. It affects our physiology. Um, so this shows arousal level over the, over the, um, up the side. And what we would want to be able to function is to be in that nice yellow comfortable zone most of the time. But what sometimes happen when you're um, influenced by trauma is that you can either get too much rage, anxiety, so it's really hard to manage it, or kind of numbing out at the bottom where you feel numb, no energy, you sleep, you faint, you've got low blood pressure and you're feeling quite disconnected and can't think properly. Um, and again, there's kind of strategies of, of trying to find a way of managing it so that it's in the middle more. But the first rule is that safety first, and we can't begin to heal from trauma if we, if we remain in an unsafe or traumatizing situation. And I think it's the challenge of the pandemic at the moment when a lot of us are not feeling safe, um, is how to prevent the onset of difficulties uh, because we can't begin to heal from it whilst we're still in the situation. So these are just some very general principles of what services can do. It's definitely being led by the needs of the person rather than taking a manualized or pathway approach. It's definitely about agreeing collaborative um, therapeutic responsibilities so that both parties know what to expect. Um, it's definitely about uh, empowering someone around that safety, exercise, good sleep hygiene, you know, those basics that help to keep all of us going. We need to maintain a position of solidarity with the victim. And that's it. that is sometimes what you might hear in terms of trauma stories can seem a bit unbelievable, particularly if you know the family and, um, or it might seem that where people wouldn't do that to each other. And unfortunately they do. And even if it seems bizarre, there's often an emotional truth in it, even if it's got distorted over time. Um, we also need to focus on strengths as well as problems. And you know, the people who I've met who have been traumatized have dealt with things that I couldn't imagine how to deal with. And to focus on 
their strengths and how they survived that is a very important part of keeping that relationship where somebody can see that they do have some value and, and um, capabilities. There's also an attitude of respect and regard and genuineness that's, that is needed um, and a sense of, of believing their position or trying to understand what things are like for them. And as I mentioned before, this aspect of empowerment comes back time and time again. Trauma disempowers. So in order to heal, you have to have opportunities to make decisions for yourself. Now, there's a lot of debate around um, trauma memories and, well, how can we rely on those or not? Um, and traumatic memories are not always in terms of, you know, those words and pictures that you can talk about. Sometimes they're held in the body. So you might get a particular bodily uh, sensation or a particular emotional reaction rather than actually a flashback, particularly when the adversity has been there very young. Um, so memory isn't always what we think of in terms of those that, that we can articulate. Those memories that are autobiographical, though, are always a reconstruction. And there's a need to tolerate not knowing exactly what happened. And that is the challenge, I think. However, having said that, it is not uncommon to forget or suppress very difficult memories. That is more common than most people would give uh, credit for. It's also not uncommon for people to keep to themselves things that they're ashamed about. So, you know, on services, we have this um, kind of routine inquiry uh, push, which is a good thing. Uh, but people don't need to be asked all the time. And, you know, if, if I was to ask all of you right now on first meeting, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? You wouldn't tell me. I'm guessing that you would either tell me something not quite so bad or fudge it a little bit because that's what we do. And um, so when somebody changes their story, their trauma story, that's actually very common. And it doesn't mean they've been deliberately lying. It means that it's been either unable to put it into words or too ashamed and don't trust you enough to put it into words. The other thing is that memory creates our sense of self. When we think about who we are, we are partly based on that, on how we've been treated by other people, um, what sense we make of ourselves, and it creates a sense of continuity over time. And for some people with quite extreme traumas, uh, it creates a fragmentation in the self because you can't bear to think about certain things that have happened to you. And that means that that is one of the things that goes to the core of complex trauma, the disturbance in the sense of self and how you, your sense of self is experienced. And things like hypervigilance or so constantly watching or constantly um, disconnecting and distancing yourself from these things inhibit the laying down of autobiographical memory. So that actually it's quite difficult to recall and report a coherent narrative of what happened. So this is an important point next that I want to say, although I've, I've just outlined there a little bit about the impact of trauma. Being aware of the impact of trauma is not being trauma informed. What is being trauma informed is that you're able to relate to people in compassionate and regulating ways. That was demonstrated in the Scottish video, I think, really well. Um, being trauma informed means that your service, your whole service in your community facilitates that process. It also means that you work to prevent harm. Being trauma informed means that you are able to look after those around you and after yourself and you seek justice when things are not as they should be. Um, being trauma informed means that you probably don't seek to pathologize people's distress, but you seek to understand it in its context. And therefore it's more the, the problem is more located in the context than in the person. Um, that you adapt or learn skills to heal the impact of trauma, whether that's in yourself or in those who you're trying to help with, um, who have been traumatized. And being trauma informed means that you don't delve for details. You don't need to know the details to be trauma informed. 
that isn't what being trauma informed is about. And for those reasons of that I've just outlined in terms of how hard it is to talk about these things sometimes, we wouldn't do that. Also, um, it can be very dysregulating to tell, to tell your story. And in order to tell your story, often there needs to be a process to make it safe enough to do so. So let's look at the implications then of all of this. So this is um, this was published in the Psychosis Journal um, a couple of years ago. During the last 25 years in secondary mental health services, I've had a little opportunity to have my story heard or the support to make sense of what happened and is still happening to me. This is the story of a non-person, of a walk-in diagnosis of a set of symptoms, someone who's been on a cocktail of toxic drugs with no informed consent. The childhood abuse wasn't talked about. I wanted to talk about it, but nobody ever asked me the right questions, so I stayed silent. I hear rumours of something called trauma from K, and it seems that this is the closest thing to care and compassion I might expect. So the voice of lived experience is one of the main drivers, I think, for trauma and form care. And we need to listen to that and respond in our services to what we can do differently, perhaps. So there is an impact on helpers. And I think, you know, it's not just um, hearing the trauma stories, but it's also working with uh, the impact of trauma that can be uh, very troubling and it does change your world view. And the kinds of risks that might be there are um, the carious trauma, which is that trauma that we might suffer at work as a result of our work and hearing those stories. We might have compassion fatigue and how hard it is to maintain that and not burn out. And burnout is when you're feeling emotionally detached from your work. And there is a professional quality of life questionnaire freely available online. You'll also find it in the on the Recovery College online on some of their other trauma courses. Um, if you want to, feel free to have a go at it and see where you are as a as a person who works in healthcare, perhaps. Um, but what I would say is that also working with trauma can be incredibly rewarding, very life affirming, and often these issues emerge when you haven't got a system to support the work when you haven't got good enough supervision when the work is not as of value um, and I think that buffers it very uh, very well so in traditional mental health services often we think you know we try and kind of diagnose the, the, the problem within the person um, so that, you know, the person is left thinking, well, there's something wrong with me. But in trauma-informed care, you'd see the problem is located outside and that the person is suffering and reacting to what happened to them, which is a different worldview of suffering, I think. But because of that, um, we also need a very multifaceted nature of uh, recovery. So we might need to think about relationships. Yes, somebody um, how think also somebody thinks and feels about themselves. We might need to think about the neurobiology and then we might need to think about our communities in terms of that response. And I think, you know, we uh, psychological therapy, I have seen, you know, because that is my uh, area of expertise has been incredibly helpful for a lot of people. But there are also other things, you know, and peer support. And that value of true solidarity and mutuality is very important route for many people. Often people find uh, routes to healing through some kind of purpose or having an absorbing activity that they can get involved in. Sometimes it's uh, nature is very healing. Um, creativity can transform it into something else. Uh, physical activity because what that does is it really grounds you and helps you to regulate your body. And then some people become activists and get very politically engaged. And all of those routes often provide a way of either healing or acceptance or even growth from trauma. It isn't always problematic. Um, and I think often in services, you know, we, we think, well, how when do you do the trauma-focused work, that bit of actually processing the very troubling 
memories. And I would say that that is scattered throughout the healing journey, but usually around about the middle. And the focus changes over time from being those things that help somebody to, to become a bit more stable and to find a life with more meaning and less trauma in it. And then towards the end, you need a process of kind of consolidation, um, refinding what your sense of self is and finding a new place in the world. And in terms of those process and those trauma memories, the kinds of things that help are being very uh, grounded in the moment with both the mind and the body. Often being able to talk about trauma without getting caught up with it completely so it doesn't swamp you, um, that's very important. You need to be able to build the tolerance for the emotion without the avoidance and then the emotion does lessen. You need to learn how to relate to other people through a relationship and that those relationships can often be healing. And you need to make meaning of the event in a way that doesn't feel too uh, catastrophic. And this is a really lovely example of somebody who um, called Indigo Dyer, who, who has lots of blogs. Uh, and the first uh, picture on the left there is a, a, a picture that's kind of part of her, but also part represents um, her abuse that she saw is evil. You can see it was kind of quite scary. But then she developed um, a kind of an, a, a way of approaching that, that part of her experience with love and kindness that then transformed this exactly the same experience into what you can see on the right. And I think her, her artistic um, creativity and her skill there has done that really well. And what she ended up seeing, what she thought was evil, actually was transformed into being an injured lover in her case um, and that I wasn't evil but I was hurt and that this knowledge was healing her so you can see that th that process I think is is really well on that healing journey there so why do we need to be bother being trauma informed well I've mentioned the lived experience calls to action uh, we do get better outcomes if you focus on what the problem is rather than what the symptom is. And by doing that, we also have less cost to services, and that's important. Um, there's more public awareness now of the impact of trauma and abuse on people. And so that is creating a bit of a driver, I think. We now have a policy context for the first time in England, and the 10-year plan does say that we're required in the NHS to be trauma-informed. We do need to prevent iatrogenic harm from services. Um, it also protects staff wellbeing. And the evidence that trauma increases the risk of many health and social problems, I think, means that we're beginning to see those in a different way. But I just want to tell you why, what motivates me. I remember um, when I first came into the NHS in 1990, and I was working in a long stay psychiatric hospital. And I was working with some people who had been there often for up to 50 years. They'd been put in there when they were a child and I had to go back and look for what was the original diagnosis. And when I was looking through those notes, what I realised that was that there were some people put in there at age 11 and 12 for being morally defective because they were pregnant. And I was quite horrified at that because I thought, well, who, who is the moral defect here? And those people had lost their lives to, to that as a result, something that was not their fault and something that had happened to them that was illegal. That really motivated me. And then um, a while later, kind of later in the 90s, I moved to a small town where lots of people knew each other. And it was then possible to hear stories of uh, abuse of those most people who were most suffering with their mental health. They wouldn't tell me their stories, but the um, person on reception might tell them what tell me what had happened to them or I would get to hear about what happened in that family from somebody else who I was seeing and so I started to fit the pieces of jigsaw together and realize how endemic it was within um, the population that in services were often labeled as severely mentally ill and that seemed to me to be too much of a coincidence um, so that really motivated me I didn't feel like I could see mental health in the same way after those experiences 
Um, and it's really good to see now that services are, are taking this on a little bit more. So there are some principles that, have, that also we can learn from other uh, major incidents. And these principles I've put together from a lot of the kind of uh, charity documents who work with um, mass casualty events uh, abroad. Principle one, I think, is that you need a good, uh, you need good coordination across multiple partners, because otherwise, if you're too encapsulated within that, you get you you get kind of gaps in the system, and often those people who are most traumatized and complex, there's no way for them to go. So without that coordination, um, there's it creates uh, too many loopholes for people not to have their needs met. We also need to focus on physical safety and health of communities. Um, we need to take into account the economic and social fallout and that needs buffering and mitigation. We need to strengthen natural supports in communities and foster uh, their empowerment, capitalise on their knowledge and value their resourcefulness. Um, we need to uh, have kind of normalisation principles and leaders so that that the whole system has that language of not pathologizing people who are reacting to circumstances. And we need services to be flexible, easily accessible and respond in the way, an adequate way to different needs and choices, which it might include some specialist interventions. So this is, um, we did uh, a national summit a couple of years ago in Durham where uh, from lots and lots of stories of good practice, we pulled out what actually helps this to be implemented. And I'm now going to try and come out and show you another video. So I really apologise in advance because it might not go very well. Um, so the the uh, anyway, that'll tell you the key themes. So just this is one framework for thinking about how to implement trauma informed values and practices into our services and systems. An important theme within this framework was that of personal relationships. That's the relationships both within services and between services, and with people who engage with those services for support. Our relationships and our social connections are vital to healing from adversity and preventing that happening in the first place. The kind of relationships that are important are based on mutual respect, authenticity, moral courage and empathy. We really hope that people can be motivated to stay connected and repair damage and disagreements because that's what promotes trust. It was really important that leaders and organisations are not just promoting trauma-informed values but living them themselves that they're appointed and held to account for the way they contribute positively to such a culture. This culture supports staff resilience and well-being. The theme of structure represented those things that services choose to deliver and the way that services are organised and commissioned. Some trauma-informed organisations might need to deliver a range of interventions aimed specifically at healing and growth. All services, however, need to be organised collectively to bridge the needs of all the population seamlessly. The theme of process represents the way that services deliver what they do and the language they use to describe things. Trauma-informed services pay attention to power differences Adversity and trauma disempowers people. So services that are trauma informed emphasize empowerment and choice. It needs to use a language that demonstrates that people are understood as reacting to context, that allows multiple perspectives and is free enough of jargon that allows more people to join in the conversation and not feel stigmatized by the language used. Safety was vital attention to both physical safety and also psychological safety. 
People's narratives described how important it was to feel valued, to have a sense of belonging, and to feel safe from bullying. Let's think about healing from trauma then. What are we actually trying to do? Quite often, what might be we might be tempted to think about is that we need a bit of a recipe. So a bit like baking a cake. Well, if we do this, this and this in this order, then healing will happen. Unfortunately, it's not like that. Very rarely anyway. Um, not with complex trauma, it isn't. It's not even very complicated in that if you do lots of complicated things, you'll eventually get to where you want to be, like building a rocket uh, to go to the moon. It's not like that either. It's much more like raising a child in that there's not necessarily a right or wrong way of doing it. There's broad sets of principles that you need to follow. But the main one is that you need to adapt to the needs um, that you have in front of you with, with that, within that relationship. So um, this is really important because then when we come to think about healing, we need to acknowledge that this is a, always a complex uh, journey that we are on, even if it might be relatively brief, it's still very needs led and interactive between us and the person who we're trying to help. So instead of looking at the world like the top thing where, you know, if you just follow this route, you'll get to where you want to go. We might need to think more collectively about networks and how we um, how we change the way we think about a way forward, which is much more interactive, much more collective. And this uh, infographic is, is by uh, Systems um, Innovation, some Systems Innovation people, which I really like. So I've talked a lot about power and I've talked a lot about thinking about complexity. And I think one of the key things to think about then next is this ladder of engagement. So um, quite often, you know, as a trauma expert, I might be asked to um, do something to somebody that will help them recover. And I probably have done that before in the past. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I would say that is not always the most helpful way to go often at the other end where you are devolving responsibility and giving people the capacity and resources they need to heal together is often another way of doing it and what you get from that is you get much more uh, empowerment much more challenge to any uh, stigma and language you get the leader, so the leadership being from the inside out so that they really know what it is that they need. And then you get various kind of levels in between, which I would call co-production or engagement. And it's not that all of those, any of those are right or wrong, but what we do need to think about carefully is the right kind of method um, for the right kind of process. There is um, a national community of practice for trauma-informed care and the email there, um, Anne Richardson at ahsn-nenc.org.uk. Um, if you want to join, please uh, send her your request. You can find the NHS collaboration platform online um, and you put in trauma-informed care. You can see it there, so you can also join through that. This was uh, funded initially by NHS England after the national summit. For, um, to create a kind of network of people who can uh, really move this forward in terms of UK practice or in English practice anyway, uh, but we do have members from all over the UK. So we host regular webinars, uh, they are available online. We post all of the uh, best trauma-informed documents um, onto the platform. There's an opportunity to chat and connect with other people on issues that you're working on. Uh, so hopefully some of you might find that helpful. And I suppose I'd leave you with a bit of a challenge really. You know, trauma-informed care is not just about um, the skill and it's not just about the way service organs, it's also the way the pay, way we talk about uh, what's important to us. So what story can you tell about what may, motivates you to be trauma-informed? What story shows us the shared value of social safeness in our world? 
in healing trauma and creating resilience. And what story can you tell about why action on trauma and mental health is important right now? And that's it for me. If any of you are struggling, you can, um, if you're staff, there's a staff wellbeing hub on that link attached there. Um, there's also uh, the Recovery College Online has lots of resources and other sources of, su of support. Has anybody got any questions? Has any um, questions emerged in the chat at all? Let's see. Oh, 15. Has anyone monitored the chat? Perhaps you can let me know if there's any key questions I can pick up. Um, people are having to leave yet, understand that. So what key advice would you give to those who are looking to develop trauma from care in their services? Work out who your allies are. So try and get a little group of you together. If there's more than one of you, that'll help. See if you can get any senior sponsorship or ally there who will at least um, support your work. Uh, that always helps. Um, not making things more difficult for yourself. So just do what seems possible and just start there, um, whatever, wherever that might be. Um, and I think once you show the value of it, other people then tend to want to come on board. So unless, um, if you have any other questions, you can, uh, I'm sure I email the team, but this will be made available uh, on a public platform. So you can watch it again or share it amongst your colleagues. Uh, thank you, everybody. That's bye-bye from me. Bye-bye.